Hey guys, Joe Parzinski here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to the shop. Bear with me for a second while I take care of some business on the top of this video. It'll only be a second. You know, I had a chance to attend the 2018 Bar Z Summer Bash out at Stan Zinkowski's place out in California. And Stan, fantastic job, but I can't imagine how much work and preparation and phone calls and aggravation it took to actually set that all up and make it look so seamless for all of us. I had a chance to meet a lot of the guys that I've looked up to for the last couple of years and will continue to look up to uh, channel hosts that have welcomed me into this community and made me feel quite welcome. So thank you for everything. Thank you to all the other guys. And I really enjoyed meeting and shaking all the hands of the creators and the supporters and subscribers. It was truly cool. And it's open to the public, by the way. If you are a machinist or interested in this type of fabrication, that particular event, you can buy a ticket and you can attend. So keep your eyes peeled for the 2019 Summer Bash. We have no idea where it's going to be probably at the Bar Z, but if we're going to grow and get really big, then it might have to go somewhere else. This year, there were a couple of other guys included in that community at the Bar Z Bash that were not primarily machinists, and one of them well-known, of course, Jimmy DeResta. Really enjoyed meeting Jimmy. He's an incredibly creative guy. Uh, he just He's a maker. This guy can just pull things out of thin air, and he's very talented. He's good with his hands. But he wears a watch when he's doing it, and that bugs me. But hey, Jimmy, watch your hands, bud. Anyway, if you haven't checked out Jimmy DeResta, go check him out. Cool channel. The guy makes a lot of really neat stuff. Uh, in closing on the way home, boarding the Southwest flight out of California to come back to Austin, the pilot that was picking up the connecting flight out of Oakland was a fan, had a ticket to the bash, had to work, couldn't make it, and as luck would have it, the man, the pilot, Guy Lopes, Southwest Airlines pilot Guy Lopes, I hope I'm saying that right guy, made us feel like royalty on the way home and uh, absolutely his level of courtesy and professionalism was off the charts. So thank you very much for making us feel like celebrities. Anyway, today's topic, fly cutter. Basically a simple instrument, single lip cutting tool, and in my opinion, gives the best finish that you can possibly achieve with any cutting tool. Uh, on a manual mill or a CNC mill. I just love the fly cutter for putting that cosmetic shine on the part and making it look great. It is also a very good tool to indicate whether or not the head of your machine is square. If you're plowing across the part with a fly cutter and you're cutting a nice circle on the front and all of a sudden here comes the back of the tool and that starts to cut too, well chances are your tool's digging in. Now a lot of guys said, well I don't have that problem because the back of the tool never cuts. Well, maybe the side that you're leading with is the low side, you know, drop the cut down a little bit, go back the other way, check it both ways. That's the only way to be sure whether or not the bottom of the tool is true. Anyhow, the mistake that I see made more often than not by guys that just grab a fly cutter and set it up is they take a turning tool from their lathe because it's high speed steel and it fits the groove in the fly cutter and they lock it in and then they look at it, load it up and turn the machine in the appropriate direction. See, now that's the trick, the appropriate direction for the tool to cut. Most lathe turning tools, the majority of the ones you're going to see, are right-handed tools. Now how do you know a tool left hand, right hand, right? You look straight down the front of the tool and check out which side the cutting edge is on. That's simple. So if you have a tool bit, look straight at it. Cutting edge is on the right hand side, that's a right hand tool but a fly cutter takes a left hand tool. So if you put a right hand tool in a fly cutter, it changes the geometry and changes the finish. Let me show you why. It's just like boring a hole in a part, right? So you have your bore in your part, you want your cutting edge to be on center as you're boring down, it gives you the correct shear, everything works fantastic. If you have a fly cutter, that has that channel in the bottom. One face of that channel is on center with that tool and that's to help you put the cutting edge of that tool on center with the, with the holder itself and for it to hit the appropriate geometry when it cuts. If you put the tool in here and here's your cutting edge, well you can see what's happening. Now you're scraping the material off because you're uh, technically above center and you're pushing the material out of the way and you're never going to get that good clean shear that you should. So when you put a tool in a fly cutter, make sure you put the tool in with the cutting edge against the center rib of the fly cutter. 
Very important. Not rocket science. A lot of the comments that I've had also say, I am blowing the corners off of my plastic parts. Why does this happen? Why is it that the last two corners on the end of that plastic part just detonate and chip off? Well, if there's no chamfer call out on the top of that block, you're either going to have to take another couple of cuts to get rid of that crack, or you're going to have to figure out why it's cracking. And I'm going to show you why it's cracking. All right. There's your cutter. Got a nice sharp point on it. Really here and here. Coming around. As you get to the end of that plastic part, this geometry right here is going to translate to the cut. Greatly exaggerated, mind you, but here, here's how it works. As this cutter is moving across, forming that particular undercut, as that undercut gets over here somewhere, and that tool starts to reach the end of the cut, you have more surface contact right here against the face of this tool than you have support right here. So now that surface becomes the dominant surface. This little web right here is no longer the dominant surface. So when it cracks, boom, there it goes. The corner of your part is going to go because this big monolith on the top just pulled it off as a matter of force. There's no way around it. No way around it with that tool. Now it's a real simple fix to avoid chipping like Delrin acrylic plastics that, that have a tendency to want to shatter. You take that tool and you grind it the other way. Here's your cutting edge, here's your cutting edge. So as you're coming across that, as you drive this tool across that part, this just simply fades away until you have a nice clean surface. This is the cure. If you're blowing the corners off of your plastic parts, it's because the tip of your tool is raked the wrong way. Rake it the other way. Now, can you fly cut just about anything? Yeah, you can. Bear in mind that a fly cutter is a single lip tool, and the RPM versus the feed rate is going to greatly affect the surface finish that you get. Because it's 90% of the time, that cutter is not touching that part. It made its cut, and it's coming around for another one while you're still cranking. So you've established a greater gap between cuts and that's going to add to a serrated finish on your part. Let's say you have that tool again, that sh blunt, sharp, whatever, you're cutting steel. You don't want a real pointy tip on a steel part because it's going to break it down real quick. As you come across with this fly cutter, as it goes ka chunk ka chunk ka chunk or greatly slowed down, of course, you're going to have little ridges in your part. You're going to feel it. It's going to translate. Simple solution to a better finish on a fly cutter, put a nose radius on there, round it off. That way as it comes across, those little serrations that are formed are more like waves. The surface finish is going to be incredibly different if you put a little nose radius on your tool. It allows you to feed a little bit faster too. You'll feel it, you'll see it, dial it in, experiment. I'm going to walk out to the machine. We're going to put those two different types of tools in the part, in the cutter. We're going to blow the edges off of some acrylic, and I'm going to prove that that particular philosophy does work. And I'm going to show you a couple of different fly cutters. Basically just diameter, so what's the big deal with the diameter of a fly cutter, right? Well, if you've got a big block and a small fly cutter, and you've got your tool hanging out four inches on one side, it's going to oscillate. It's going to be very unbalanced, so in my opinion, the closer you can get the body of your fly cutter to the size of the part that you're cutting, the better off you're going to be for balance. The machine's going to run a little quieter, a little smoother, and it may translate to the finish if the finish is critical. Let's take a walk out to the bench, blow some parts up, get it done. This is my fly cutter collection. I only have three, and they are very similar, and I made all three of them. If you've never made a shop project or a shop tool for yourself, Fly cutter is certainly an awesome thing to make as a first time. It's really a no-brainer kind of project. Take a piece of stock, turn it down, put a slot in the bottom, 
pick the size tool bit that you want to use, half inch or three eighths or whatever. Make sure one side of that slot is on center and the other side is going to allow for the installation of your tool. Two or three set screws to suit and depending on how radical your wedge is you might want to put some type of relief cut here so that the balance of the tool, the mass of the tool is equal from the center line out on both sides. Uh, it's going to be unavoidable that it's going to be a little bit heavier on this side and you don't want to take too much of a relief cut off of there because you don't want to compromise how rigid the tool is. This is a tool that I would use for plunging a radius down the side of a part since there is no bottom relief, this is straight. This would be for straight in applications, making a radial cut like a woodruff key or something, or running a scallop down the side of a larger part to accommodate a nest of some type. This little guy here, I love this one. This is a really stout 5 16 18 set screws. It's only an inch and a half in diameter, three quarter shank, but this is a brutal little tool. This is extremely tough and does perform very well. I like the board demonstration on the inside. You can see the difference in the profile of these tools. This one will give you that reverse wedge uh, cut that is more likely to knock the corners off of a piece of material over this style right here, which is the solution to that problem because the chip deteriorates as the cutter passes across and the load on the corner is greatly reduced. One of the things you do want to be aware of when you grind your tool make sure that the point of contact is the highest part out as the tool rotates make sure that whatever back relief you have ground on your tool let me change that so you can see it there you go make sure that the contact point of your tool is the farthest point out if this back relief is not aggressive enough it's very possible that the back corner of the tool may also be influencing the cut and as you can see looking straight at the tool as described, this is a left hand tool because the cutting edge is on the left hand side. Actually if you were to take a right hand tool it would still fit, but that right hand edge would be way over here and the geometry would just be scraping the material away as opposed to a nice clean shear as it comes around. I do have a chunk of acrylic loaded up in the mill. We're going to take these two tools as they sit right here. I'm going to change the cutter, the holder, everything in between cuts. We're going to take this one first, exact same speed, exact same depth of cut, and hopefully this one's going to blow the corners off and prove my point. Uh, it's also going to give a nastier finish because the radius on this corner is extremely small. And this one will give a much nicer finish because of the deteriorating cut and a little bit larger radius on the bottom. Let's load them up in the mill, snap some plastic. If all goes well at the end of this demonstration, we're going to have some considerable chips right here. I'm going to take a cut that's a little unorthodox or a little bit deeper for a fly cutter just to prove that the rake angle on the front of this is probably going to blow these corners up. Now to look at this top surface finish on this part, with the impact coming in from the front, the front edge is going to be nice and sharp. This may be a little bit ratty. The center in the rear here is going to be uh, not too bad. It may, it may shelf burr from a push. But I say these two corners here are going to crack off and ruin this part. Cut's going to be about 100 and let's go about 120 deep on this and use the power feed so I can use the exact same feed and depth of cut for each pass. Uh, I'm only going to make one with this, then we're going to swap it out after inspection and see what the other tool does. Let's take a look. I would say that yielded exactly what I wanted to see. That is a catastrophic finish and that is just strictly because the angle on the tool was dominating the cut. We have a terrible ratty edge on the back. The leading edge is just completely detonated. Let's turn this piece around and see if my front edge prediction is correct. And I'm going to bet that it is. 
There you go. Flawless finish on the front corner because that's the sheer corner. And with any cut, you have a sheer edge, which is this edge, and you have a smear edge. So as it's the impact is here, the forces are this way, when it gets around to the back, there is no support material, so you can see what it did to the back of that part. It absolutely cratered it. And if this was a final cut or a roughing cut and you didn't have enough material, well, you have to take the walk of shame and go tell the boss. So let's put the other cutter in, take exactly the same depth of cut, same speed, and see what kind of results we get on that. This cutter is a little bit larger in diameter, which is going to help somewhat. But the leading edge being so drastically tilted forward and a small radius on the bottom should eliminate all that chipping and yield a much better final result. Make sure we are in focus, which we are. 120 deep, 1800 RPM, power feed, and let's see what happens. Proof is undeniable. Let's move that out so you can see it. Got an absolutely beautiful rear corner. Little bit of shelf burr, not much. And I would say that's probably because the tool is not as stone sharp as it could have been. But you can see the difference in the front edge. There is absolutely zero chipping along the front edge. The back edge is just beautiful. Let me pull it out. A little bit closer look at that. I'll move the piece up because I know a lot of you guys are going to complain about the camera, so bear with. Night and day difference, and that's just strictly because of the grind on the tool. Speed was the same, feed was the same, depth of cut was the same. perfect edge both sides you can't beat it guys if you're having trouble with your blowing of corners off your plastic parts make sure you change over to a tool profile that looks like that preferably not fuzzy but a tool profile that looks like that with the leading edge out and it should eliminate all your problems and your chips thanks for watching